Good evening. Welcome to our online Bible study on the life of the Apostle Paul. Um, I just wanted to let you know tonight is not a live study as we have done in, in previous weeks. My wife and I are on vacation, and so these lessons have been pre-recorded so that we can continue the study even while uh, we are away on our vacation. Lord willing, we'll continue with these pre-recorded lessons over the next week or so. We plan to be live again on Wednesday night, November the 25th at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I hope that you can join us uh, for those uh, that live broadcast. But if you just keep tuning in on Wednesday evenings at 6.30, the regular time, you shouldn't miss anything. And uh, everything should be back to normal on November the 25th. Tonight we are going to be starting back in Acts chapter 21, and we're going to be moving on into Acts chapter 22. Um, you know, um, Paul made the Pharisees mad just by looking at them. In their rigid world, uh, blind men were blind because they were sinners. And people like him uh, didn't get second chances. Jesus, if you remember, healed a blind man. And what perturbed them about the blind man was how he had gained his sight. Back in John chapter 9, verse 11, it says, He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received my sight. But this was the Sabbath. <laughs> Everyone knew that making clay on the Sabbath was sinful. Therefore, Jesus was a sinner, and sinners couldn't perform miracles. This had to be some kind of a trick. And so they said, give God the glory, they said, egging this fellow to confess. We know that this man, speaking of Jesus, is a sinner. But the blind, uh, the man who had been healed of his blindness, he could only answer in, in John 9, 24, whether he's a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. And he just stood there and blinked at him. <laughs> and that just really made him mad. The Jewish leaders in Jesus' day were responding in frustration to an unanswerable argument. You know, they could fuss all they want about the fact that Jesus healed this guy, and they could accuse Jesus of all kinds of trickery and all kinds of other stuff, but the one piece of evidence that they could not refute was the fact that this guy was blind, but now he could see. And that proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was the Son of God. Now what was ironic was the Pharisees, who supposedly had healthy eyes, they couldn't see that. In our passage tonight, in Acts, Paul is standing before another spiritually blind group at the temple. And he's about to tell them how he used to be like them. But now he sees. Now, he's not going to use heavy theology or brilliant logic, you know, like the blind man in Jesus' day. The argument of his changed life will be unanswerable. The events surrounding Paul's first defense of the faith can be divided into four separate sections. The first section concerns the presentation itself. At the stairs leading into the military barracks, the Apostle Paul asked the Roman commander if he can speak to the hostile crowd that's still calling out for his death. In Acts 21, verse 40, 
we read, So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, saying, now it goes into chapter 22, verse 1, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Now, the Hebrew dialect, the language that Paul was speaking here, was Aramaic the language of the Jews uh, there uh, uh, in, in Palestine. And so by using their local language and calling them brethren and fathers, he was identifying with the people. The first door anyone must open in order to ministering to others. And continuing his efforts to win a hearing among them, Paul gives further credentials. He says in verse 3, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous toward God as you are all are to this day. I persecuted this way to the death binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness, and all the council of the elders, from whom I also received letters to the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. Paul's heritage, his training under the highly respected Gamaliel, and his energetic zeal to keep the law and to expunge Christianity, it gives him street creds with his audience. And using plain language, not fancy or religious jargon, he's making himself very real to them. And that opens the next door, sharing his salvation experience. We read in verse 6, Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me, and I fell to the ground, and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now, this is a crucial point in Paul's presentation. For now, the mob has at least come to terms with the fact that Jesus Christ is alive. Now, they thought they had nailed him to the cross. They thought they had shut him up in the tomb. But Paul is saying, no, I saw him alive, and he changed my life. And as the people listen intently to what Paul is saying, he continues his story about how the light blinded him and the voice told him to go on to Damascus. And having been led by the hand into the city, he waited there for Ananias to come to him and to heal his eyes and gave him a, a new commission. Then Paul relates a part of his story that we didn't hear in Luke's account of his conversion. In verse 17, Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance, and saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. See, that's what Paul did in his old life. Imprison, beat, approve of the stonings of Christian. But the Lord utterly interrupted and divinely moved in his life, and that changed the course of its direction. You know, the most radical shift in Paul's thinking occurred when God explained to him his new plan for the world. 
So Paul, he recounts to his Jewish listeners what the Lord told him next. Verse 21, Then he said to me, Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. Gentiles, boy, at that mention, red lights flash and sirens buzz immediately in the minds of Paul's zealous Jewish audience. Did he say Gentiles? Yes, he did. The man actually used the G word. Boom! That's all that volatile crowd needed to hear. What an explosion. They had heard enough. It was not Paul's experience with Jesus that set the crowd off. It was his mention of the Gentiles. This man is concerned about Gentiles. We don't talk to Gentiles. We don't relate to Gentiles. Our children don't go to school with Gentiles. We don't want anything to do with those Gentiles. See, to the Jews, the Gentiles were like a pack of wild dogs. That was all the crowd needed to hear. And although Paul wasn't quite finished with what he wanted to say, in their minds, he was done. Verse 22, and they listened to him until this word. And then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. Then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust into the air. You know, (laughs) the possibility that God could relate directly to the Gentiles through Christ (laughs) That greatly offended them. See, in their way of thinking, all others in the world, except for God's chosen few, the Gentiles, or or the Jews. You know, only the Jews were worthy of God's salvation. Um, Certainly those Gentiles were not worth it. Enraged, This crowd would have torn Paul apart if it had not been for those soldiers protecting him. And yet, in the Jews' reaction to Paul's words, notice what was absent. They shouted, they stamped, they threw dust in the air, but no one countered Paul's defense. They couldn't argue what Paul was saying. His argument was unanswerable. He had presented a subjective account of his changed life, and he had backed it up with the objective reality that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. In in addition, that same risen Christ had changed thousands of other people who, along with Paul, were turning the world upside down. All this evidence was just too much for them to handle. And when the Roman commander saw them become violent, he reacted quickly to silence the riot. Now, we pointed out last week that this commander, he was Greek-speaking. He didn't understand Aramaic, and so he had not understood a word that Paul had said. In his mind, something criminal must have been behind all the turmoil. And in verse 24, we read the commander ordered him to be brought back into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging so that he might know why they shouted so against him. Now, why would the commander order him to be scourged? Now, this was not really a punishment per se, but it was simply the most effective way of extracting either the truth or a confession. The scourge was a leather whip studded at intervals with sharp pieces of bone and and, and stone. Uh, few men survived it in their right senses, and many folks died when they were being scourged. Paul was stretched out over the stump, his wrist and his ankles were bound with leather thongs, and in a few seconds, Paul would feel the stinging smack of those straps of leather tearing into his already scarred back. However, there was a small problem with this method. 
which Paul wasted no time in bringing to their attention. Verse 25, And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander, saying, Take care what you do, for this man is a Roman. Then the commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? He, Paul, said yes. The commander answered, With a large sum I obtained citizenship. And Paul said, But I was born a citizen. Then immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him, and the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. Now, imagine the shock that came on the face of the guy with a whip. I mean, he had no clue that Paul was a Roman citizen. And he immediately informed his superior, who went to the commander, and the whole torture was halted. And suddenly, all of these soldiers are afraid. See, under Roman law, citizens of Rome were not to be tortured without a fair trial. And these soldiers were about to commit a crime punishable by death. So it was like when Paul says, is it lawful for you to whip somebody who is a Roman citizen? Put the whip away, get him out of there, untie him. You know, this whole thing had to be exasperating to this Roman commander. He had to pay bribes. He had to buy his citizenship, and he told Paul so. And Paul calmly says, oh, I was born a Roman citizen. (laughs) Case closed. (laughs) The issue would be forced to go to the Jewish Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin. Knowing that it was illegal for a Roman citizen to be bound and beaten, Paul stops the soldiers in their tracks. For although Christ had called him to suffer for his name, that did not include enduring needless suffering. And Paul knew his task wasn't completed yet. He still must go to Rome, and so he wisely guarded his life. As a result, since the commander couldn't whip the answers out of him, he turned him loose again to his own people. We read verse 22 in in chapter 22, verse 30. The next day, because he wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews, he released him from his bonds and commanded the chief priest and all their council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. Now, we'll reserve Paul's address to the Sanhedrin for next week. But for now... Let's pause for a moment to review a couple truths out of this passage. First, from Paul, we learn that experience alone is questionable, but a testimony based on facts is unanswerable. See, whenever you and I witness, the focus of our witness ought to be Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection. See, these are the bones and the muscle of our testimony. And our personal experience is the flesh with which our hearers identify. Experience without facts removes the substance of our claim, resulting in a defense of Christianity that can be easily struck down. See, if our testimony is just simply, well, Jesus makes me feel good, then our argument for Christianity is easily answered. Well, that's fine for you, but it's not fine for me. So how can we present an unanswerable argument for our faith? Before Paul spoke of Christ, Paul began his argument by identifying with his listeners and describing portions of his life. So why don't you do this? Just think about a few folks with whom you would like to share your testimony. 
How could you describe your life in a way they could relate to? Paul then explained his encounter with Christ. Think back to the moment when Christ confronted you on your own personal road to Damascus. You know, when they got to Damascus, Ananias' prophecy verified Paul's vision. Maybe we could ask ourselves what biblical facts validate our experience. You know, if you need some help remembering, uh, perhaps some of the following verses may help to supply you with some facts you need. Uh, for example, Jesus is God in the flesh. Uh, you can find that in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. Or how about the truth, Jesus lived a sinless life? You can find that in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. Or how about the idea that my sin condemns me to death? You can find that in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Or how about the, the truth that Jesus died on the cross in my place? You can find that in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. You also could use the truth that Jesus' resurrection guarantees my new life in him. You can find that in Romans chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. The next thing we see is how Paul explains how he received forgiveness by calling on his name or trusting in Christ. Maybe you can explain how you came to trust in Christ. Finally, we see where Paul told of his mission in life after he became a Christian. You know, maybe God called you into some special work that, that he has prepared for you. <coughs> now, Paul's audience reacted violently to his testimony. And your listeners, too, may scoff at your testimony, but they're not going to be able to deny the facts. Now, hopefully, they'll accept them. Then they would have an answer for your argument, <laughs> I believe. <laughs> now, the second thing that we can learn is that humility is one thing, but indignity is something else entirely. You know, when, when, when those soldiers were preparing Paul for scourging, you know, he could have thought very piously, well, this suffering is God's will. I shouldn't defend myself. But Paul understood that being needlessly victimized is not the same as humbly suffering for Christ. You know... The scourgings of a battered wife, an abused employee, a molested child, those are not examples of biblical submission. You know, there is a time to claim our rights as citizens of God's kingdom and defend ourselves. You know, indignities tolerated in the name of submission are the scourges of the human spirit. They violate a person's worth of self-honor and self-esteem. They may be verbal, they may be nonverbal, they may be subtle or even outright against a child, against a spouse, against a friend or a co-worker. Have you been victimized by a wrongful demand for submission that assaulted your dignity? If you've been abused, you don't need to endure it silently any longer. You know, Jesus never meant biblical submission to be an excuse for abuse. Of all the spiritual disciplines, none has been more abused than the discipline of submission. Nothing in religion has done more to manipulate and destroy people than a deficit teaching on submission. The limits of the discipline of submission are at the points of which it becomes destructive. 
It then becomes a denial of the law of love as taught by Jesus and is an affront to the genuine biblical uh, doctrine of submission. Therefore, we must work our way through this discipline with great care and discernment in order to ensure that we are the ministers of life and not death. You know, in the same way that Paul had rights as a Roman citizen, you have rights as a citizen of God's kingdom, the rights of dignity, self-respect, and honor. If you are being abused or someone in your home is, take the first step to freedom by calling it what it is. Don't be afraid to stop denying it. Denial is not your friend. It's just another attacker. So understand, you do not have to allow yourself to be abused. My hope and prayer is is that if you are in a situation where you are unsafe, my prayer is, is that you will seek safety. Um, find someone that you can trust. Uh, find someone who can, can help you. Um, it, it would be the best thing for you. And let someone pray for you. Let someone help you in your situation. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you this evening. Lord, we just pray that you would be with each of us tonight. Lord, you know our hearts. You know the situations that we're in. Father, I pray for those who are maybe trying to defend themselves and maybe they're wanting to share their testimony and they don't know the best way to go about that. Father, I pray that you would just give us wisdom, help us to take lessons from as we've seen Paul uh, give his testimony here tonight. Father, I pray that you would help us. I pray that you would give us wisdom, give us the words to say. Lord, we just pray that you would just uh, be with uh, those watching tonight. Lord, you know the... the uh, uh, s s individual situations each find themselves in. I do pray for safety for those that might be undergoing abuse or uh, maybe are, are being taken misunderstood. And, and Father, we pray that you would grant them safety. Uh, you would help rescue them from that situation. Father, we pray that tonight your blessings would be upon our, our lesson. Help us to become better witnesses for you. Father, we ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, as I said, my wife and I are on vacation, and so we are not going to be broadcasting a video this Sunday, but we will be back next Sunday at 6.30 p.m. with part 29 of our Life of Paul online Bible study. Again, that study will be posted at 6.30 p.m. It will not be a live broadcast. The lesson's been pre-recorded, and it'll be posted at the regular time. If you miss any of the lessons or sermons, you can check them out on Facebook, or you can also go to our YouTube channel and watch them there. Just type in Lebanon First Church of God into the search bar on YouTube, and you should be able to find our channel. If you have a Google account, a Gmail account, you can log into YouTube using your Google account and you can actually subscribe to our channel. So hope you check it out. Thanks again for joining us this evening. May God bless you as you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You are loved. We'll see you next time.